welcome to episode 64 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we will continue with the tales of Troy with the story of the Argives. Paris was an emissary to Sparta, had been guilty of a grave breach of laws governing a guest and his host and the right of peoples. His action bore instant fruit. The line of kings, powerful among the heroes of Greece, was roused in raging fury. Menelaus, king of Sparta, and his elder brother Agamemnon, king of Messene, were descended from Tantalus. They were grandsons of Pelops, sons of Atreus, men of a noble house whose history was rich in conquest. Besides, Argos and Sparta, most of the states of the Peloponnesus, were subject to these two brothers, and the rulers of the rest of Greece were their allies. So, so when Menelaus heard the news of the rape of Helen, he left his old friend Nestor and hastened from Pylos to Mycenae, where his brother Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, Helen's stepsister, were king and queen. Agamemnon shared his brother grief and anger, but spoke words of comfort to him and promised to remind Helen's former suitors of their oath. Then the brothers traveled over all of Greece and asked its princes to join in the war against Troy. The first to accept was Tilpolemus, famed ruler of Rhodes, a son of Heracles, who offered to furnish ninety ships for an expedition against the treacherous city of Troy. Then came Diomedes, son of Titus, who promised eighty ships with a crew of the most valiant men in Greece. And these two princes had conferred with the Atridae in Sparta, the Dioscuri, Castor and Polydeuces, sons of Zeus and brothers of Helen, were also invited to join. But they had already gone, for at the very first report that their sister had been carried off, they had sailed in pursuit of the robber, and got as far as the island of Lesbos, close to the coast of Troy. There a storm struck their ship, and it sank into the sea. The Dioscuri themselves disappeared. Legend, however, had it that they did not perish in the waves, but that Zeus, their father, set them in the heavens as a glorious constellation. And there through the ages they performed their office as protectors of ships that sail the seas and as patron gods of those abroad them. And now almost all of Greece had risen to the call of a tridae. Only two princes hung back. One was crafty Odysseus of Ithaca, Penelope's husband, who did not wish to leave his young wife and his infant son, Telemachus, for the sake of the faithless queen of Sparta. And so, when Palamedes, son of Prince Nobleus of Euboea, the staunch friend of Menelaus, came to him with the king of Sparta, he pretended madness, yoked an ox and an ass to his harrow, ploughed his field with his ill-matched team, and scattered salt instead of seeds in the furrows. He arranged for the two heroes to see him engaged in this strange occupation, and hoped in this way to exclude himself from a campaign he did not favor. But wise Pelamets saw through the wildest of all mortals. While Odysseus was guiding the harrow, he secretly went to the palace, took the child of Telemachus from his cradle and laid him on a part of the field where Odysseus was about to turn the earth. At that, the father carefully lifted the harrow across the boy, and the heroes shouted to him that he had proved he was quite sane. Now, he could no longer refuse to take part in the expedition, and though in his heart he swore bitter enmity to Palamedes, he promised to put at the disposal of King Menelaus twelve ships from Ithaca and the neighboring islands, each with its crew. The other princes who had not yet given his word to join, and whose whereabouts were not even known, was Achilles, the young and splendid son of Peleus and Thetis, goddess of the sea. When he was newborn, his immortal mother wanted to make him immortal too. So when night came, 
unbeknown to Peleus, he laid the child in celestial fire, which was to purge him of whatever mortal parts he had inherited from his father. By day, she healed his seared flesh with ambrosia. Night after night she did this. But once Peleus spied on her and cried aloud when he saw his son quiver in the flames. This hindered Thetis from perfecting her work. Sadly, she abandoned her infant son, whom she had not succeeded in making wholly divine. Nor did she return to the palace, but sped to the cool sea kingdom of the Nereids. Peleus, who thought that the boy bore dangerous wounds, lifted him up and carried him to Chiron, who was versed in the art of medicine. The wise centaur, the rearer of many heroes, took the boy tenderly and nourished him on the marrow of bears and the liver of lions and boars. When Achilles was nine years old, Calchas, a Greek soothsayer, declared that Troy, the far-off city in Asia, which was destined to destruction through the Argives, could not be conquered without the son of Peleus. Thetis, his mother, heard this prophecy in the depths of the sea, and because she knew that this campaign would bring death to her son, she rose through the waves, secretly encountered her husband's palace, dressed the boy in girl's clothes, and in this disguise took him to King Lysimedes on the island of Skiros, who brought him up as a girl and had him perform the dainty tasks of a princess. But when the boy arrived at an age when the first down appeared on his lip, he discovered himself to Didamia, the king's lovely daughter. A tender love sprang up between these two, and while the people on the island took Achilles for a kinswoman of their king, he was really Didamia's husband. Now that he was indispensable for the conquest of Troy, Calchas the soothsayer, who knew his abode as well as what was destined at him, told the Atridae where he was to be found, and they at once dispatched Odysseus and Diomedes to enlist him in the war. When these heroes came to the island of Skiros, they were presented to the king, his daughter, his kinsmen, and handsmen. But the face of Achilles was still so delicately lovely that even though the two Achaean princes had watchful eyes, they could not detect him from the group of girls. Then Odysseus had recourse to ruse. He had a spear and shield carried into the room where the girls gathered, but so that it seemed by chance, and then bade one of the men sound the trumpet as if foes were approaching. At those martial notes, every woman fled from the chamber. But Achilles remained and boldly seized the spear and the shield. When he realized that his disguise no longer availed him, he offered to join the army of the Achaeans with a fleet of fifty ships and promised that he himself would come to the heart of the Mermindas or the Thessalonians, accompanied by Phoenix, who had educated him, and Patroclus, his friend, who had been reared with him in the house of Peleus. The leaders of the various peoples chose Agamemnon as their commander-in-chief, since he was the most active in furthering the enterprise, and he selected the port of Aulis in Boeotia, near the Straits of Euboea, as the meeting place for all the Argive princes with their men and their ships. Besides those already mentioned, there were many others. The noblest among them were mighty Ajax, son of Telamon, of Salamis, and his half-brother Teucer, the unerring archer. Ajax the less from the land of Locris, Menethus of Athens, Ascalaphus and Iamenus, sons of Ares, and with their people, the Minions from Boeotia, Peleus, Arcelius, Clonius, and Prothenor, from Phocis, Scidius, and Estrophius, and Euboea, Elephenor with Abantes, Diomedes, Stinilus, son of Capenius, and Eurylus, son of Mesistius, was part of the Argives. And the other Peloponnesians, from Pylos, Nestor the old man, who had seen three generations grow up from Arcadia, Alcapenor, son of Asenus, 
from Ellis and other cities, Amphimachus, Talpus, Dioras, and Polyxenus, from Dolicum and the Echinades, Megis, son of Phylus, with the Aetolians came Thos, son of Adramon, from Crete, Idomenus, and Marianes, from Rhodes, till Polymus, a descendant of Heracles, from Sine, Nereus, who in beauty exceeded all men in the Argive host, from Calidne and the Heraclidae, Phidippus and Antiphus, Phyles, Podarsus, son of Iphicles, from Phiri and Thessaly, Eumelus, the son of Admetus, and devout Alcestis, Methon, Tomaxiu, and Melabioyu, sent Philistetes from Tica, Ithome and Achelia came Podilierius and Machuan, both versed in the art of healing, from Orminum, Eurelas, the son of Euamon, from Argesa, Polypetes, and the son of Pirithus, friend of Theseus. Genius represented Cyphos, and Prothus, Magnesia. Beside the Atridae, Odysseus and Achilles, these were the princes and commanders of the Greek, who gathered in Aulis, and each came with a great fleet. In those days, the Greeks were sometimes called Danai, a word derived from Danaeus, an early king of Egypt, who had settled in Argos and the Peloponnesus, and sometimes Argives after the most important region in Greece. Argolos, or the land of the Argives, they also went by the name of Achaeans, because in olden times, Greece had been called Achaean. It was not until later that they were called Greeks from Gracias, son of Theseus, and Hellenes after Helen, son of Decalion and Pyra. And here ends my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.